Hello, my name is Zaki, and I'll be giving an overview of our paper, which was on modeling dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, also known as DCE MRI, using a reference region and input function tail. DCE MRI involves a series of images with a tracer. The end result looks like a movie showing the arrival and uptake of the tracer. The tracer concentration varies as a function of time, and we can get quantitative estimates by fitting a model to the data and looking at the fitted parameters. The model in this case was the extended TOTS model. And what it says is that suppose there is a voxel with some cells, then the uh, space between the cells is described by VE. And if there is a blood vessel passing through the voxel, then the volume occupied by the blood plasma is VP. And there, the contrast agent or the tracer is in the blood vessel, so the rate at which it leaks out is described by K trans while the reverse process is described by KEP. To estimate these parameters, we need to know two things. The first is the concentration in the voxel, and the second is the concentration in the blood vessel, which is also known as the arterial input function. The arterial input function is hard to measure because it requires a fast sampling rate in order to characterize the initial peak. So in this case, this input function was sampled every five seconds, but had it been sampled let's say at 15 seconds, then the initial peak would have been missed entirely. The problem with using a faster scan is that it requires making sacrifices to image quality. Since the input function is so hard to measure, one alternative is to use the reference region model, which uses a reference tissue, such as muscle, instead of the input function. The advantage of using something like muscle is that even if the sampling rate is low, the curve shape itself does not substantially change. However, while the TOTS model gives us K-trans, VE, and VP, the reference region model gives us relative parameters. For example, it gives us K-trans in the voxel relative to K-trans in the reference region. And so if we want the actual K-trans, we have to know what the K-trans is in the reference region itself. The common approach is to use muscle as the reference region, and then look at muscle perfusion studies in the literature and use values from there. But the problem is that muscle varies across patients, so a single value will not be appropriate for all patients. So our goal was to develop a way of estimating these reference region parameters. And we start by noticing that uh, the reference region model already estimates Kf for us, and Kf is equal to K trans over VE. So we only need to know either K trans or VE, and we can calculate the other parameter. Our solution relies on noting two features. The first is, as uh, mentioned in the last slide, that the reference region model already estimates the KF for the reference region. And the second thing we note is that the late portion of the input function does not require a fast scan. These two features are used with the following equation, which was derived in the paper. The numerator requires knowledge of the concentration in the reference region, along with KF of the reference region. Uh, the KF we can get from the reference region model. And the denominator requires knowledge of the input function. However, we don't need to know the full in input function. We only need to know the tail, which is the stable part. And if we were to plot the numerator and the denominator for different values of t, then the points fall along a line, and the slope is an estimate of the K-trans for the reference region. So to recap, our method uses the reference region model to first estimate the relative parameters along with the KF for the reference region. We then use the equation along with the input function tail to estimate K-trans, and then we can get VE by uh, taking K-trans and dividing it by KF. So once we know the parameters for the reference region, we can then use these to convert the relative parameters to absolute parameters. And this method is called the reference region and input function tail method, which is abbreviated to RIFT. This is an example of the parameter maps using the TOTS model in the top row, which uses the full input function, while the bottom row uses RIFT. And the parameter maps look similar using either technique. The temporal resolution in this case was 5 seconds. The advantage of RIFT is that since it does not require the initial part of the input function, it remains consistent even at slower uh, temporal resolutions. So in the following case, uh, the K-trans from the TOTS model and uh, K-trans map from RIFT look similar when the temporal resolution is 5.5 seconds. However, if the data was downsampled to 33 seconds, then the map from the TOTS model becomes underestimated, while the map from the RIFT method 
tends to stay consistent, meaning that we can use the rift method even at a slower temporal resolution and still get maps that resemble a high temporal resolution scan. Another thing to note is that the tail part of the input function is not only easier to measure, but it's also more consistent across patients. For example, these two input functions are from two different studies. These are population averages, where the error bars indicate the standard deviation. The error bars are largest around the peaks, whereas in the tails, the error bars are quite small. What this indicates is that rather than having to measure an input function tail, we could assume one from literature, and it might work just as well. So we tried this in the study, and we got a pretty good agreement between using a measured input function tail versus a literature-based input function tail, both using the RIFT method. In conclusion, we proposed a method for analyzing DCMRI using a reference region and input function tail. Since this method does not require the initial part of the input function, it is viable at slow temporal resolutions, down to 30 seconds. If an input function tail cannot be measured, then we can assume an input function tail from literature. Lastly, the code for the study is available on GitHub. I would like to thank the Cancer Imaging Archive for providing the DCMRI data, along with the following sources of funding, and thank you for watching.